Proceedings Magazine over the last year, year and a half, China, Russia, cyber warfare, artificial intelligence, anti-access, area denial, near-peer threats, et cetera. Uh, so it's, uh, this, this should be a very lively discussion. And as I said at the start, uh, we have microphones, so when we switch to the Q&A, please move to the microphone so we can get your, uh, everyone can hear your question and also we can get it on tape and get it on the, the, uh, the webcast. Um, before I introduce the moderator of today's panel, I want to thank Northrop Grumman for sponsoring this panel discussion. It's, uh, it's difficult for us to do much of anything without our corporate sponsors. Northrop Grumman stepped up to sponsor today's panel discussion, and uh, they are represented this morning by Kevin Kelly, who is the Director of Business Development for Northrop Grumman. Uh, is Kevin in the audience here? Hand. All right, well, he's here on the floor, probably running around with uh, the, the big um, corporate representation that they've got here to, uh, out at West this, this year. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce the moderator for this morning's panel and also to thank Vice Admiral Doug Crowder for stepping in at the last minute for Admiral Gortney, who, um, despite having 5,300 mishap-free mishap free hours in uh, naval aircraft, was not able to uh, get here for reasons of uh, commercial airline availability uh, today. But Admiral Crowder stepped in at the last moment. Thank you, sir. Uh, Admiral Crowder is a career surface warfare officer, graduate of the Naval Academy in 1974. He commanded the USS Kidd, Destroyer Squadron 24, Carrier Strike Group 9, the Abraham Lincoln Strike Group, and the US 7th Fleet. Uh, prior to his retirement in 2009, Admiral Crowder served as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans and Strategy. He is now the chairman of the Olmsted Foundation. The Olmsted Foundation, their flagship program is the Olmsted Scholarship Program, which provides uh, scholarships for junior officers of the military to study overseas, to get master's degrees in foreign languages, uh, studying abroad. So, Admiral Crowder, thank you for being here today, and thanks for stepping up and moderating this panel. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, I am not Bill Courtney. Um, but uh, we're here for what I think is one of the most important panels uh, of this week, especially for those in uniform, as we have the community uh, leaders here to answer your questions. And we will have time for a question and answer. The question posed to the panel is, what are the major warfare communities doing to adjust to the increasing near-peer threat? A couple of editorial comments to start off. The U.S. forces have been primarily focused for the last 16 years on counterterrorism. Some O5 in our services, O5s in our services, that's all they know. Many of us have watched over the last decade and a half Carrier strike groups and, and expeditionary strike groups run, run straight through the Med or straight through Westpac and, and out to the 5th Fleet AOR. My favorite story is after taking command of the 7th Fleet in 2006, uh, I had 10 uh, P3s assigned to me, and by mid-2007, uh, I had one. The other nine had, went, uh, had been grabbed because there was no ASW threat in in the South China Sea, as you know, and they were grabbed to go out to Fifth Fleet AOR, my friend uh, Bill Gortney. Uh, so I sent my task force commander uh, out, and he came back. I said, what are they doing with the P3s out there? And this is a quote. This, he said this to me with a straight face. They're flying around looking for guys with beards, uh, individual terrorists. So uh, again, a lot of focus elsewhere over the last decade. Meanwhile, Russia has been re-emerging. Those of us who saw the submarine, their submarine launched uh, land attack cruise missiles, you can't help but be impressed by that. Their air force in Syria was successfully able to destroy the city of Aleppo, uh, no doubt and their incursions into Georgia and the Crimea and, and also uh, Ukraine, the other part of Ukraine, have, have been uh, noteworthy events. China has emerged at the same time. 
as our friend Harry Harris likes to say, building a wall of sand uh, in the South China Sea, their string of pearls concept throughout the world, building carriers, their submarines are plentiful and are at sea, and they have a clever way of intimidating our friends and allies out there. So no problem, because we have been fully funded to do both counterterrorism and prepare for these sorts of threats, right? Uh, no. Uh, we've had a decade of CRs, continuing resolutions. We've had years of the Budget Control Act sequestration. We've had major issues with some of our larger Tests, tests, all right, we're back. Uh, as, as I said, the, the issue with a decade of CRs. Shortney did it. And uh, really the years of the sequestration, major issue with some of our larger programs, LCS, F45 comes to mind. And we're just off a pretty tough year in 2017 with uh, the Fitzgerald and the John S. McCain collisions, uh, tragedies, and the ensuing comprehensive and strategic reviews. Wow, tough challenges. The good news is we have just a panel to show us the way fair. And today I'd like to introduce them very quickly, all the way to my left, your right, is uh, Vice Admiral Rich Brown, the Commander of Naval Surface Force, for two weeks now, Rich? I think, starting th week three. Starting week three, yeah. um, Rich is a Naval Academy grad, a career surface warfare officer, commanded the USS Sullivan's, the USS Gettysburg, Carrier Strike Group 11. Ashore, he spent a lot of time in the personnel world, including EA to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Manpower Reserve Affairs. He's just coming from Commander of the Navy Personnel Command. Next to him is the brand new Air Boss, uh, who's in week three, I believe, right? Just finishing up. Just finishing week three as the air boss, uh, Vice Admiral Chip Miller. Chip is also a graduate of the Naval Academy, uh, strike attack guy, uh, uh, nuclear power trained, XO of Vincent, CO of Nashville, and commanding officer of the USS George W. Bush, commander of Carrier Strike Group 2. Lots of time uh, in, the, in the Pentagon as well, and has recently come in as dr from Director of Air Warfare. Next to him, Vice Admiral Joe Tofalo, again, a Naval Academy grad, uh, career submariner, including command of USS Maine and Submarine Squadron 3. Uh, he uh, commanded as a flag officer, Submarine Group uh, 10, and he, his previous job was Director of Undersea Warfare and has been in his current job since September of 2015. So you're kind of the, the old guy, Joe. N next is uh, Vice Admiral Jan Tai, again a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, has a doctorate in electrical engineering, uh, cryptologist, uh, lots of time in the NSG Naval Support Group uh, area. VQ-1. She commanded the 2,800 personnel at, uh, at Kenia in, in Hawaii, was the 10th Fleet Commander uh, as well, and has assumed her duties as the N2, N6, and also the 66th Director of Naval Intelligence in July of 2016. And to my immediate left, is Major General Eric Smith, Commanding General of the 1st Marine Division, and he went to an accredited university. Uh, Texas A&M, I can say that as a fellow Naval Academy grad. Um, uh, J 
General Smith is an infantryman, has served in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, three tours uh, combined in Afghanistan and, and Iraq during uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, was the senior military assistant both to the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and uh, is in his current job since June of 2017. So with that, I'm gonna start with our first question. And uh, as I mentioned before, we will stop in enough time for at least 15 minutes of questions, hopefully from junior officers. So to the panel, question number one, as, we've, as we have set up near term, near peer competition is back and our military must be able and prepared for a high end war fight against more capable adversaries. How are your communities preparing for near peer conflict? And we'll start all the way down the end uh, with uh, Vice Admiral Brown, please. Thanks, Admiral Crotto. So as the Admiral uh, pointed out, uh, I haven't quite finished my third week uh, as Commander of Naval Surface Forces and Commander uh, Naval Surface Force U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, but within those uh, first two and a half weeks, uh, I transmitted two messages. The first one was a P-4 to our commanding officers, and the subject line of that P-4 was command. Uh, I absolutely value command. The way that the United States Navy commands and the philosophy of our command has been the bedrock of our success for over 240 years. I told our commanding officers that I implicitly trust them, but with that uh, trust comes incredible and unyielding accountability. Uh, but what I would do, and I dedicated my service as their commander to making sure they have everything that they need to make sure that they're successful in command of uh, their ships. The second message that I transmitted was to all Naval Surface Forces, and it laid out three guiding principles of how would we, we would get after that uh, near-pair competitive fight. Uh, and, I, and if we adhere to these three guiding principles, uh, we will own the fight. Uh, the first one is good stewardship. Uh, I, I like to tell even the youngest sailors on the ships that 60% of our fit fill in our ships comes from accession sailors. And many of our sailors join the Navy right after graduating from boot camp, and that means their relief is in the eighth grade, because typically sailors are sent to ships under five-year orders. So it's about good stewardship. It's about good stewardship for them to make sure that our ships are materially maintained so that when you pull the trigger, the gun goes boom, the engineering plan is safe to operate, the morale is high on the ship, there's a clean place to eat and sleep. And I related to him in this manner that I asked him how many of them have little brothers and sisters who are 12 or 13 years old, and many of them raised their hand. And I say, that's good stewardship. You want to make sure that that ship is ready to fight not only for yourselves, but for those young Americans that are going to come behind you. If we follow the guiding principle of good stewardship, we will produce warships ready for tasking for our numbered fleet commanders and meet that near pair competition. The second one is professional development. We ask a lot of our sailors, but it is an imperative that our sailors are well-educated, well-trained, and well-qualified. And a crew that is well-educated, well-trained, and well-qualified is a crew that knows the ship's missions and her systems and will be able to take that ship into the fight and win. The third guiding principle is safety. You know, going to sea in ships is inherently dangerous, but I will tell you that we should never unnecessarily put any of our shipmates' lives in danger or into bodily harm. And uh, with that comes the application of risk management. I tell them, don't necessarily assume someone senior to you has thought of the consequences of an action. And they could simply, they could save a shipmate's life or save a shipmate from bodily harm by simply asking the question, should we be doing this? It's not only important to understand and apply the concepts of safety and risk management in our phase zero operations or in our basic phase of training or intermediate and advanced phase of training, it's also important that we practice that during phase zero because it's incredibly important to understand the concept of safety and risk management when we get into the fight. Because we have to be able to get into the fight and continue the fight, uh, taking all those uh, concepts uh, into consideration. 
I think that if we do well in these three areas, we will own the fight. And in short, we will be the fastest, the smartest, and the most capable Fort Naval Surface Force out there uh, in the fleet. Albert Miller. Thank you. Uh, the beauty of just taking over a job, and anybody that's had a change of command, it's, it's no different at whatever level uh, that you are entering the job. But you get an opportunity to um, not change the direction, but just increase speed, uh, provide a little sense of urgency and, and a little focus to what we're doing. So taking over as Commander of Naval Air Forces, uh, I was approached it the same way I've done any other change of command. And so we said, hey, let's just sit down and take a look at our mission, our vision, our, uh, where our priorities are, and let's just make sure that we have them uh, all aligned and that we know exactly what it is that we're doing in order to get after, uh, I don't like to call it a near peer threat, I like to call it a peer threat. Um, growing up, the Soviet Union was, was 10 feet tall, and, and I like training against that 10 feet tall adversary, and so that's the same way that I approach it. So back on the mission and vision, you know, it's pretty simple. We man, train, and equip deployable, combat-ready naval aviation forces that win in combat. Very simple. What are our priorities? Priorities are war fighting. War fighting and people, and the readiness of both. And so when we talk about that, so priority one is war fighting. Priority one is people. And how do we keep them ready? And so that's where you get into the current readiness, future readiness. What is it that we need to resource our sailors, our aviators, to be able to win in combat? First thing is a realization that it's not just about us. And what I like about this panel is we're sitting shoulder to shoulder with the people that we go to battle with. Um, with uh, because we are a joint force in and of the Navy. We operate across domains and we operate as strike groups, and we operate as teams. So I look at naval aviation, I look in the future, and, and I get excited. Uh, I look at the introduction of fifth gen aircraft onto our carriers, and the mix of fourth gen and fifth gen, and I say, we will be more lethal. I look at Growler being across our strike groups and having next gen jammer on their wings, and I say, we will be more survivable. I look at the introduction of the E2D and advanced data links throughout our Navy, and I say, we will be more networked. As we transition out of the C2 into the CMV22, and I look at all the advances we're doing with respect to logistics, and I say, okay, we are gonna be more sustainable. As I look at MQ25, the IOC at Triton later this year, and MQ-8, which you'll see on the other side of that um, partition there uh, when you depart uh, this venue, and I say we are more unmanned and more autonomous. Then I take a look at Ford and the Ford-class aircraft carrier, and I say we will be relevant well into the future. But what puts it all together, though, are trained people. And so to answer your question, Admiral Crowder, I think the biggest our strategic advantage is in our training. And so I look at what we're doing out at Fallon and a live virtual constructive and how we're improving the ranges to make them more representative of a high-end fight. Uh, to look at how we train virtually such that uh, our adversaries and what we see in our cockpits and the threat presentations that we get absolutely make sure that not only do we have the right equipment, but we absolutely know how to operate it, and it will allow us to win in combat. So as I look at all of that, and you couple that trained sailor, trained aviator, who works with his partners, uh, I'm very confident in our future, and I say we are more ready. Admiral to follow. Yeah, thanks, Admiral Crowder, and again, uh, thanks for stepping up here for uh, Admiral Gortney. I'd also like to thank Naval Institute and FCA. I see uh, Admiral Pete Daly, uh, General Wood, General Shea. Uh, appreciate your leadership in this venue. It's a very, very important. Um, I'm going to answer the question kind of from uh, kind of two points. I'll start with, you know, the stuff we have now and then kind of get into the training piece uh, just like Bullet did. Uh, 
uh, so first off, uh, first and foremost for the submarine force as we, as we look at the high-end fight is our number one mission of strategic deterrence. Uh, Seventy percent, you know, in fact, effective yesterday when the New START Treaty uh, essentially was declared, uh, you know, entered into force, uh, the United States Submarine Force is responsible for 70 percent, seven zero percent of the nation's accountable nuclear warheads. That's a big number. Uh, definitely something that's all about uh, near-peer competition. We execute that mission with very, very high uh, execution rates, 99-plus percent type execution rates, and rightly so. It's a zero-fail zero fail mission. Um, second thing would be our Virginia-class submarine. It's uh, the best submarine on the planet. Uh, I can look anyone in the eye and say that without question. Um, but it is going to drop to, uh, you know, our force is going to drop to about 43 SSNs in the later part of the 2020s. So maintaining that minimum two-peer build rate is absolutely vital. Um, next would be our acoustic superiority program. Uh, I cannot overstate the importance of the acoustic superiority program. Uh, you know, when you boil it all down, a submarine fundamentally turns acoustic superiority into tactical superiority. So that's kind of foundational for who we are. We're not, we're the, we're not called the silent service for nothing. Um, and so uh, the, the, the work we've done on USS Dallas, on USS Maryland in prototyping, uh, and South Dakota, who's kind of the next big prototype uh, ship here for acoustic superiority is, is, is huge. Definitely focused at the high-end fight. Uh, we're also working on improving missile torpedo EW capabilities a family of uh, unmanned undersea vehicles and uh, unmanned systems, um, all a big part of that, of, of the stuff that we have now, if you will. Uh, but like the two gentlemen who's spoken before me here, the, the training piece is absolutely key to, to uh, the high-end fight. Uh, you know, a submarine sitting next to the pier is capable of doing one thing, rusting. Uh, it takes the people properly trained to bring that bring that submarine to life. So I have spent uh, a, a big part of uh, my two and a half years in the job on doing what I call retuning the FRTP, the, uh, the Fleet Response Training Plan, the, the cycle which you prepare for deployment and execute deployment. And uh, we have been, been all about retuning the Submarine Force FRTP to be all about that high-end fight, making sure it's much if very, as efficient as it can possibly can be, make sure we have our, our uh, when we hit the surge ready certification, which happens to be our tactical readiness evaluation, the ships have been, have been addressing that, that milestone exclusively. And then when we get to the end of the, the cycle prior to deployment and we, and we are, need to be focusing on the challenging peacetime missions that the submarine is going to do uh, and our, 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 uh, our, our POM certifications, our overseas certifications, that we're peaking at that point too. And this has been very, very effective. Uh, you may not realize it, but the majority of the Navy has gone to the optimized fleet response training plan, which is a 36-month cycle. Submarine Force still does 18-month FRTPs, double pumps inside that turning radius. So I've got to be very, very efficient in my, uh, in my preparation for those forces, and the training piece is a huge part of that. We've also been doubling down on tactical development, making sure we pay ourselves first and, and do the tact dev that's needed. Uh, we only did five tact dev Xs in 2015 and in 2016 we increased that to 24 and they're not just quantity they're quality they're done far forward in representative environments and uh, the standing up of the undersea warfighting development center was a, a huge part of that uh, of, of that uh, that whole initiative um, we're increasing our sub on sub time to make sure that uh, we're ready to do those those uh, high-end warfighting missions but also those challenging peacetime missions that submarines have to do. And we've also been putting a lot of work into uh, a, an EW uh, uh, campaign plan, electronic warfare campaign plan, to make sure that uh, both policy, doctrine, training, kit, support systems are all, uh, are all uh, very much focused on this, which is an additional part, EW that is, of the high-end fight. Okay, Admiral Todd. Thank you, Admiral Crowder. Um, when, it, when we think about, I'd like to answer the question in, in two kinds of ways. Um, when we think about the information warfare community being focused, refocused, or retuned on the long-term strategic competition that we're facing, 
uh, it's very easy to look back at the last 20 years and realize that the CT and coin fights that we've been in have heavily leveraged naval information warfare professionals in that fight. Um, so, so you know, we haven't been in a maritime specific fight, but we have been in a fight. And when we think about the intelligence, the cryptologic and the information technology, information professional folks, they've been serving forward in the fight. And I think it's very clear that a lot of the skills that they have maintained and honed in that fight are going to serve us well looking at the long-term strategic competition. But clearly, the skills that we've developed in that CTU fight is not sufficient to the fully to the need. So focusing um, the intelligence and the, and the cyber cryptologic warfare folks on the cognitive do domain of our adversaries, of our potential near-peer adversaries, you know, what will deter them? You know, if deterrence fail, ha fails, how will we understand how they might maneuver? Um, that, that type of focus has n really never gone away. We do that with um, relationships across uh, the interagency. And, uh, you know, my good friend Bob Sharp is back there, Office of Naval Intelligence, has never taken the eye off the ball on Russia and has continued to build capabilities against China. And so, you know, focusing on the cognitive domain there and what we must do in a high and maritime fight, what we must be prepared to um, understand in that fight is, is something that we have to be able to do. Also, when you think about the RF spectrum and, and uh, you know, how we've fought over the last 20 years, um, getting into a contested RF spectrum is going to be fundamentally a different matter. And so continuing to hone the skills um, of, of our team, either in electromagnetic maneuver warfare or on the IT, IP side of the house, to be prepared to fight to establish assured command and control in that contested environment um, with the idea of space also being contested, that's, that's, a, that's a huge hurdle and a huge step that we're getting very focused on very fast. How those domains, the maritime domain and the space domain, potentially maneuver together and preparing our sailors for that fight is a key element. In cyberspace, I would say that you know, over the last uh, eight years, we've been fairly focused on the near-peer competitor in cyberspace, the near-peer competitors in cyberspace. So continuing to hone our cyber warrior's ability to fight in cyberspace, to fight through attacks, to be able to detect, react, and restore uh, is something that we've been on a path and we'll continuing to continue to examine uh, our readiness in that fight so we can take that to the maritime domain and, and assure mission uh, in the maritime domain. Uh, and then uh, Admiral Tafalo talked about the undersea and acoustic superiority. You know, clearly understanding the undersea from an, from an oceanographic perspective and then from an acoustics perspective, acoustic intelligence perspective, and our ability to surveil in the undersea is going to be critical you know, to, to meeting the challenges that we, that we face there. So expertise is clearly one area that we'll continue to focus on building that expertise while we're in the fight. Um, every day, most of, our, most of the information warfare professionals out there are on mission every single day. There's no rotation off of mission. We're always on mission. Um, the other aspect that I think is important for people to understand is our organizational approach. Information warfare, um, you know, like the other warfare domains, established a, a type commander. Um, Vice Admiral Matt Kohler is the type commander for information warfare, and that happened in 2014. And we've been building the ability to generate readiness in information warfare, both for our operational commands, Fleet Cyber Command, um, Office of Naval Intelligence, and, and, the, and the, the Center for Naval um, Meteorology and Oceanography Command, but also uh, for the, the individual platform level uh, requirements that the other TICOMs have. And so 
you know, establishing the TICOM in 2014 and, and being able to generate the kind of readiness that we need for all the missions across the Navy, critically important. Uh, just last year, we established the Warfare Development Center, the Information Warfare Development Center. And when we think about the types of capabilities that, that we want to put in the hands of the fleet, um, having a Warfare Development Center to work the TTPs and work the, the mission areas and have witties that can then um, make those capabilities sing and, and help understand how to integrate information warfare capabilities in with the, uh, the other warfare areas is a critical element. And they are uh, working today, every day, with the other WDCs, and I think we're going to see great return on investment there. Uh, the, the next piece of the organizational you know, shoe to fall is establishing for information warfare something like uh, the ATG. So the information warfare training group that's dedicated and focused on, on training our folks to those high-end skills and, and, and to the uh, new capabilities that may be coming in. Uh, lastly, I'd say that in the fight, uh, operationally, we have recently um, reaffirmed our process for establishing uh, carrier strike group information warfare commander capabilities. So we've taken a new process to use post-major command, O6s, to provide to the strike groups uh, to, to be able to leverage and take advantage of and bring together the information warfare part of the fight in the strike group. As additional capabilities come in, that fight will be harder and, and more complex. And so, uh, you know, we are, um, we've established about 100 100-day training pipeline for each of the strike group information warfare commanders going out there. And uh, we're really excited about the results that are coming back, and we're going to continue to build upon that. Again, that's, that's, that's dealing with electromagnetic maneuver warfare and cyber warfare as part of the strike group. And so we're going to continue to build that and grow that um, in a very deliberate way at the strike group level, and then think about how that affects the operational level of war and what we need in our mocks moving forward to be able to sort of do the command and control of a high-end fight when it comes to information warfare. Thank you. Okay. General Smith. Thank you, sir. So for us, uh, as the Marine Air Ground Task Force, you're going to get the infantry portion of that, but I'll speak for the entire MAGTAF here. It's an overly simplistic answer, but it also has the advantage of being true. The way that we're preparing to fight a peer or near-peer competitor is all of our training scenarios are against a peer or near-peer competitor. They're all based on O-plans. If it's not based on an O-plan, then, then don't do it. Uh, there's added incentive for the young Marines to actually go out and execute a training environment that has a real name, not the, the Dakotians or you know, whatever else you make up in some of our scenarios. It's got to be a O-plan based scenario so that you have skin in the game. The, one of the things that we are trying to do and, and have done is we're using a concept called Sea Dragon. The Commandant directed it. We're pushing an infantry battalion. We Actually, we've pushed them out. They've already returned from deployment. Uh, General Krulak did this some years ago, and we're doing the next version of Sea Dragon to experiment with an infantry battalion, our base unit. What, what concepts, what equipment, what manning, what structure best works for that battalion? They've already deployed, returned, and we're doing the after action reports, and we'll continue this through multiple phases through 2020 to kind of get the infantry community exactly where it needs to be. Some of the things that we're doing are training to, to signature management. I mean, it is a fight of signatures, and I'll get to this probably later on in, in a different question, but the signature management fight is actually one we're excited about having because if we go to a completely calm, degraded environment, I win all day long because it's about training. Because if nobody's talking, I win. Because I'll guarantee you the, the Marines that we have are far better trained than the soldiers or Marines we will go up against. If they can't talk and I can't talk, I win all day long. So we're, we're trying to make sure that the Marines are instilled with the confidence to be able to go against a peer competitor. Some of it is as simple as air threats. We haven't uh, had a bomb dropped on us in almost 70 years. So you have to begin to prepare yourselves for a aviation threat, which we haven't faced since the 50s. So we're doing that. Chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear responses. We're prepping for that in a significant manner. 
because of the uh, proliferation of chemical weapons. So the basics of putting an individual Marine in his mop suit, in mop four, gas mask and tire suit, and leaving him there for eight, 10, 12 hours, that is something that uh, hasn't been done for a while, but you have to do it. As Admiral Ty said, the last 15, 16, 17 years of stability operations, counterterrorism, et cetera, very much needed and very valuable at the time, but that also comes at a cost to preparing for a high-end peer, near-peer competitor. So we have to shift off of that, and that is an entire mindset shift. There's a generation of Marine officers all the way up to major who have not done that, who have not done uh, peer, near-peer fights. The final thing that I would tell you is it's about the training environment. So between our Marine Corps uh, Air Ground Combat Center, 29 Palms, Yuma, so our, our folks that are out doing aviation at Yuma, at uh, Weapons uh, Tactics Instructor Group, if we're not maximizing our uh, range scenario, our range sets, to go up against a peer, near peer competitor, which means range modernization and utilization, then we're wasting our time. We have to get up to that so that we're actually able to use our weapon systems at the ranges that a peer or near peer could engage us at. I'm not supposed to end the sentence with a preposition. I did recognize that at Texas A&M, but I, I kind of ran out of airspace and altitude there. Um, my mom is watching. She'll be displeased. The, the, final, thing that I would, uh, the final thing that I would tell you is, is a small example. For us, it is about integrated training, both within the MAGTAF and with the Navy. We, we are a joint force. We are also a naval force. A very small example. We just, uh, within the last couple months, put a uh, high Mars rocket launcher on the back of the USS Rushmore, uh, fired it from 70 kilometers away from the sea, uh, hit a uh, target about the size of a trash can on San Clemente Island. That is how you prepare for a, a peer near peer competitor because uh, nobody wants to have high Mars coming down on them from 70 kilometers away because you don't know which ship it's on. So that is a small concept, but we can do that any day we want to. It's just a matter of, uh, of logistics and how much space. Those are the kind of things that we are doing to prepare for a peer near peer competitor. And I'll stop there. Okay, for the panel, in two minutes or less, what is the assessment of the readiness of your community to face near peer competition today? And what is your most pressing need? Now we'll start down at this end. This is double tapping the good general, but he's a Marine, he can take it. The most pressing uh, need that we have is time, period, stop. Uh, our TEEP, our training exercise and employment plan is full. Our dance card is full. So what we're shooting for is opportunities to do basic repetitive training that will allow Marines to thrive and survive the first 30 days of combat against a peer competitor. We have to have the time to do that. When we continue to be filled up with exercise after exercise after exercise, some of the exercises can become a show. Uh, it, it's a, for us, it's a training opportunity. It cannot be a show. You have to fail here because we can't fail in combat. So for us, it is absolutely 100% time so that that individual Marine, that battalion commander, squadron commander, regimental commander, group commander can reset the force, try it again, try it again, try it a new way. If he's successful, you know, God forbid he actually reset and try it a new way until he does fail in training uh, so that he knows that the first way was the correct way. But it is absolutely time and the ability to reset yourself against that peer, near peer competitor. Time. I'll, I'll leave it right there because that's a 100% answer. Admiral Ty. Well, it talks a lot about having to operate in a contested environment. And so that certainly is, um, is the thing that we need to be able to flex both in our systems and inside in the human performance factors. Um, anybody who was at the breakfast this morning heard DepSecDef talk about being able to measure performance and getting more quantitative in our measures as opposed to qualitative. <laughs> um, when we're talking about readiness, uh, as we build the palm, um, you know, the warfare communities to my left have uh, very good measures that have been generated over time. We'll see if they survive the test of uh, reform. But, but the point becomes, in information warfare, you know, having some real quantitative measures that help us understand both from an equipment perspective, how do we measure the information warfare platform, you know, for, for availability, those kinds of things, and on the human performance. How, 
are, are we sure that we're preparing our sailors to establish a SATCOM channel in a contested environment? Are, are we sure that we're ready for the EMW fight, you know, with the Slick 32 and Nolka? You know, how are we measuring the human performance pieces of that? And so, you know, as the resource sponsor, I would benefit greatly from some, you know, from some quantitative metrics that would help us really understand our readiness, you know, in a more comprehensive way. Um, so that we can assure ourselves about where we stand with the high-end fight. Admiral to follow. So the, the bottom line up front on the, the, what I'll call the capability readiness of the, of the submarine force today, to answer your first question, Admiral Crowder, is overall the, the capability readiness is very good. Um, I, you know, we have stuck to our tried and true standards-based certification process. Uh, I talked already about retuning the FRTP to, to ensure that that capability readiness is good. Our uh, force improvement and operational safety program, everything from uh, you know uh, establishing 24-hour sleep cycles in 2015, our operational safety officers uh, uh, initiative. Uh, I can go on and on. That's all fundamentally foundational to the to the you know what I call the capability readiness. Um, where, where I have concerns, and that kind of gets to the barrier piece, is in our capacity readiness, if you will. Uh, a couple of examples, barriers, if you will. Uh, the ship, the shi our shipyard workforce workload mismatch is, is, uh, is, creates a big challenge for us. I have a ship in the, in the Atlantic, uh, the USS Boise, who's the poster child for this situation. Can you imagine three weeks, three weeks prior to entering the shipyard? And every, anyone who's a, been a sailor knows all the stuff you got to do to get ready for the shipyard, families and, you know, different home port, whatever, uh, you know, crew changes, all the right people. Three weeks before entering the shipyard, finding out that you can't go to the shipyard for three years. And that submarine has been in 31 months next to the pier. This is a significant barrier. It decreases from our operational availability. It decreases from our ability to have the capacity we need. Our force structure assessment for submarines is 66 SSNs in our, in our Navy's force structure assessment. Uh, we're at 50 now, we're going down to 43 before we turn that corner and start, and start coming back around. That goes to capacity, uh, the ability to surge in time of crisis. That's a, that's, that's a barrier. Our aging Ohio class submarine. This was a submarine that was designed for 30 years. It was a business decision to extend it to 42. Enemy didn't get a vote. Okay, uh, uh, extended to 42 years. The longest we've ever had a single submarine go is 36 years. We're gonna take an entire class to 42. So that gets to margin and capacity and, and risk. And then finally, I'd mention uh, my heavyweight torpedo inventory is also an issue of capacity. So, uh, you know, we talk about this near peer competition. It's, you know, the, the greatest capability Navy in the world can still lose if they show up late. If they don't have the capacity to surge uh, that margin that's needed. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we see exponential rates of change in technology. And when you're in an exponential fight, it's winner take all. Second place is not an option. Uh, so th these, gets to, uh, 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 these get to some of the, the, uh, the barrier issues. Admiral Miller. You're going to see our answers are really similar. The point of the pointy end of the spear is sharp. Those that we deploy, those that are out at sea right now, are highly trained, highly resourced, and, and they're ready for any fight that comes their way. I look at Vincent, Reagan, TR out there right now, they're, they're doing the job, and those air wings and ship teams continue to do great. I look at our deployed maritime forces, same, same. Uh, well, we get into the capacity, and here's where I'm very similar to Admiral, to follow the years of high op tempo, years of underfunded budgets and inconsistent budgets, once again in another CR, has taken its toll on our bench. So the bench is, is where we are taking risk. It's where our capacity shortfalls are, much like as Admiral Tafalo just, just mentioned. So that's my concern. And, and with the general, it's going to take time to replenish that bench. And so the 17 budget, absolutely a shot of goodness and a move in the right direction. And the 18 budget we're waiting for. But what was delivered, again, exactly what the military 
and our forces need to be able to recover that readiness, to be able to get that capacity, to be able to fill in the bench, which is the area that we've been taking, taking the risk. So uh, I'm very similar in my response as far as uh, my shipmates up here. Um, I will also tell you that, that it still comes down to manpower and the manpower training. And so uh, making sure that I can, I can even fill in the bench and, and have up airplanes and all the parts I need, but if we don't have the people uh, that are well trained and know how to sustain it and operate that stuff, then then, then we're going to be be lacking. But but right now, that's um, we're we're in a very similar spot. Admiral Brown, uh, thanks, sir. Uh, so I will echo uh, my fellow type commanders and uh, also uh, General Smith. Uh, if you look back in the mid to late uh, '80s, when we all joined uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, we had approximately 592 ships, and out of those 592 ships, 100 were deployed at any one time. So fast forward to 2018, we have about 278 ships, and we have about 100 deployed at any one time. So that uh, uh, gets to the, uh, the issue of time and the time that we need to give to our commanding officers to prepare their crews uh, to be ready for the fight. Uh, I, I also look at the barriers uh, to getting uh, after our near-pair competitors uh, through three lenses. The first is the, the near-term uh, lens where we produce the immediate capability uh, in generating that near-term readiness that we need uh, on our ships in San Diego, Everett, Hawaii, and uh, four deployed in Japan, and making sure that we send out certified ships under the construct of the Surface Force uh, Readiness Manual. It's a proven construct and adhering uh, to that so that we deliver to the number of fleet commanders ships that are ready for tasking. Uh, the second is the midterm lens when we look at our sustainment and our growth capability. Uh, this is really the one to five year uh, time frame. Uh, we do this through the uh, fleet uh, commanders readiness council uh, so that we sh make sure that our production schedules uh, for the carrier and the amphibious strike groups are, are well synchronized with our maintenance plans. Uh, the other way that we're, that we're really getting after that is the work that we're doing with our fellow Warfare Development Center. You know, the Surface and Mine Warfare Development Center is a relatively new construct, but as we look at that intermediate to the beginning of the advanced phase, we're partner, partner, partnering with the uh, Navy, Naval Air, the Undersea Warfare Development Center, and NAVI-4, so that we're bringing those capabilities uh, to the ships and the stri strike groups early in the intermediate and advanced phase. Uh, so that we really can get to the high-end fight when we get into the composite unit training exercise and the joint task force exercise. And then uh, in the long-term lens is that future capability that we need uh, to make sure that we stay ahead of our peer competitors. You know, the CNO uh, said it exactly right at the Surface Navy Association. He said, you know, if I was a sailor in, the, in, in, the, in a Navy, I would want to be a United States sailor in the United States Navy because we have the most lethal warships, we have the best training, and we have the latest technology to fight and win at sea. Well, we have to take that long view uh, work uh, uh, out into the future so that we continue to develop that capability and we buy those ships and those weapon systems that we need for the future fight. Okay. Well, I have uh, two more pages of incisive questions that I came up with last night, but I thought I would pause now and turn this over to you, because I suspect your questions will be better. I ask that you go to the mic, you tell us who you are and what your affiliation is, and please, no manifestos, uh, uh, if you know what I mean. So with that, uh, and I'd like to see junior officers in uniform, kind of ahead of the line. So please go to the mics and we'll start taking questions now. Sir. Okay, yes sir, there in the middle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Commander Tetsuya Higashikawa from Japan Maritime Safety Defense Force. Um, as, mentioned up, as mentioned before, the deterrence power is still effective means to prevent war. I sometimes feel the limitation of the deterrence power when I see uh, the provocation such as uh, missile test and the nuclear development of North Korea. 
So my question is, what do you think is needed to have uh, effective deterrence power against North Korea and also China? Okay, who wants to take that one? So, uh, sir, I'll, I'll go after that for okay. right off go the ahead. bat. You know, one of the, one of the beauties um, and, and the power of a naval force uh, in con so with the United States and our allies is that forward presence uh, in keeping the sea lanes of communication open. Um, the, the bilateral exercises, the multilateral exercises that we do with, uh, with uh, all the allies and our partner na nations, I think sends the exact right message uh, that we're dedicated to keeping the sea lines communication open, commerce uh, flowing, and freedom of the high seas. Uh, we see that we see that in all the fleets. Uh, one of the great things about the littoral combat ship is that we're able to expand the partnering uh, with our international allies uh, as we are able to operate in areas and uh, gain access to ports that in the past weren't uh, open uh, to uh, the deeper draft uh, cruisers and destroyers. Absolutely incredibly and capable ships, especially if you look at uh, what we've done with Coronado and Fort Worth uh, on their maiden deployments and what we're going to do with Montgomery and Gabriel Giffords and then later on in Detroit. Uh, so I think that that's the key to deterring aggression is to show that we're committed, uh, we're out there and we're forward deployed but with our partner nations and with the incredible navies of our allies that if, if required, we will fight and we will win. Okay. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to bounce on that one? Okay, next question, does Maureen over here? Check, test. This is uh, Mass Arm Penn, currently with the uh, 3rd Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion out of 29 Palms. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I'll, I'll stick with one. <laughs> So uh, maneuver warfare in uh, domain is uh, particularly dependent on the understanding of key terrain. And I'm curious to know is if in that 100 days of training um, by Cyber that you mentioned uh, with the EMW, is that something that's being addressed, associated? Um, and also, what, what is involved with that 100 days of training? And are the Marine Corps commanders also invited into that in order to partner together going forward? Okay. George, you need to questions. Yeah. No, that's good. No, thanks. Thanks for asking that question. Um, when we, when we, first of all, let's let's start with the beginning. The the post major command 06s that are coming out of our IW commands from a, around the globe are then screened um, by a panel to be, you know, information warfare commanders. So it's it's a pretty, it's it's a, it's a big it's a long gauntlet to get to that point. Um, they do come with different expertise when you think about. Um, the different domains, because it could be anything from an intelligence officer to a cryptologic officer to an, you know, an I, IP officer to an oceanographic focus officer. So that hundred days is tailored to sort of fill in the gaps um, in deep expertise that that officer may bring. So we're sort of tailoring it. But to your point on the electromagnetic maneuver warfare pieces of it. Um, understanding the key terrain of, of the RF spectrum and of cyberspace is a key element in their understanding and be able to deliver for the strike group um, the types of plans and capabilities that are, that are necessary there. Um, so definitely EMW is, is a big piece of it, depending on the background of the individual officer and how much depth they've had in, in electromagnetic maneuver warfare. The notion of maneuvering a network or in the RF spectrum or space capabilities in order to you know, push back on the contestedness of those spaces is something that we're continuing to, you know, to develop those operational concepts and trying to equip our officers you know, as, you know, with the latest and greatest thinking and, and con ops in those, in those regards. Does that help? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, a uh, question for the whole panel, and we've had tidbits of this, but we talk about the importance of training for the high end. Can all of you give, you know, a few examples, a concrete thing where either you know, you wouldn't have trained on this two years ago, but you are training on it now, or you were training on it two years ago, but not very much, and you're now doing it a lot more, uh, particularly things that involve not just the high-end environment, but also cross-domain, you know, with air, surface, information, undersea, and so forth. 
Okay, who wants to take this one? We're not going to do all five. No, I'll start. Sydney, uh, one good thing about coming to this panel every year is I get to answer a question from you every year. So good to have you. Um, a, a quote comes to mind, and it goes like this. In combat, you never raise your performance to the level of your expectations. You fall to the level of your training. And it goes hand in hand with another one that says, train like you fight, fight like you train. And so when you talk about training and the importance of training, those two things kind of stick in my head when I, when I think about it. To answer your specific question, I think your question answered it for us. And it's how we operate across domains, how we don't just train as, you know, it's funny, I've evolved. My weapon system used to be me and my airplane. And all of a sudden, my, my thinking evolves as, as you get older, and, and you're now a strike group commander. And what is the weapon system? It's not the lieutenant in his airplane. It is that entire strike group. And so our training has evolved as well, not just with me, but across our Navy. I've noticed how our training has evolved, such that it is not just individual weapon systems, but it is entire strike groups and entire fleets. And so when we look at how we are taking the information um, from various platforms and how we integrate those, that's how we're doing our training now. And that training needs to continue to evolve with an evolving threat. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question. And uh, I just had to jump on it because I couldn't pass another year by without answering a question from you. So thanks. OK, right here in the middle. Thank you, General Admiral. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Johannes Kittmo, also from uh, the Royal Danish Navy, presently a student, uh, international student at the, the Naval Staff College. We can all agree on, uh, on all the good things about uh, partnerships uh, with allies, with uh, coalition partners, uh, and also when we look at uh, near-peer uh, competitors uh, in particular. Uh, but we also know uh, from uh, previous decades of uh, coin operation that it's also a challenge uh, to work with, uh, with coalition partners. And with your goals of increasing uh, speed and readiness, and at the same time incorporating allies and coalition partners, how does that go together if we don't want to, to increase the risk of, uh, of uh, mistakes or, or making our operations uh, slower in the future? So basically, how do we integrate allies, coalition partners, and at the same time increase speed and readiness to fight the future wars? So quick, uh, quick example for you. So we're conducting exercise Iron Fist this week. I just met yesterday with Lieutenant General Kobayashi of the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force. I, I think those two things are not mutually exclusive, but they don't have to go hand in hand. And you know, we like to say fast is not fast, smooth is fast. So I don't have to be physically fast, I have to be smooth. So we're doing that right now with the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Forces. Uh, we're integrating with them, we're learning what their tactics, techniques, and procedures are so that we can operate with them smoothly. So I'll take uh, four, five, six, eight different coalition partners who we're all smooth with and go against an adversary all day long because that's the great thing about being in the United States is we have lots of friends. Um, other people have fewer friends, and uh, we don't pay for ours. I mean, we, we help, but we don't pay for ours. So I think that is really the key is just you have to just do it. It's, you just have to work with them. You have to get used to, to operating with them in order to provide safety, in order to ensure that my fires, you know, we have, we have forces, for example, in the Marine Corps, Anglico, Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. I send them to my Japanese ground self-defense force counterparts, and he employs the fires. So I don't have to teach everything. I just have to provide that capability. That's a speed. I can do that literally in hours to send him down there. Hopefully that kind of gives a, a small microcosm answer but we do this with multiple allies. And I won't speak to the, for the type commanders, but, but that is not a, for us, it's not a hard concept. It's what we do every day when we're out on deployments. I'll give you another example of, of where we really uh, get after what your, what your question was asking. Uh, one of the best courses that I attend was called the SIFMIC course, which is the Combined Forces Maritime Component Commanders course. 
Uh, and in that course, I, I had fellow flag officers from New Zealand, Australia, Japan, um, uh, Malaysia, Singapore. And when you have flag officers sitting around and, and talking about how we would, we would do combined operations with our allies, that gets exactly uh, to the question that you asked. And that's how we build that coalition. That's how we build that trust amongst the allied and partner nations. So then we get out to sea and we form a combined task force. It's not the first time that we've been talking to each other. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't jump on this one as a, as a responsible, um, potentially guilty party in coalition communications. And uh, we ha rest assured that the focus on being able to do information sharing at multiple levels of classification with our partner is key and critical to you know, the naval leadership for certain, because um, I hear about it quite a bit. Um, we have been working on the mission partner environment with the whole of DOD to try to get after a, sort of an objective in state. You know, we have centrics, we have biases. What will the one solution that supports the range of things be, the range of communications, the range of classification levels? You know, we're, we're, we're tracking towards an objective in state and we're using opportunities in joint and coalition um, exercises to demonstrate and test that that objective architecture but again with our with our in the maritime you know environment putting new architectures in is is a difficult thing and so we have to be mindful of not overrunning the headlights of of our partners who can't sort of keep up with what that objective architecture is so we're we're sensitive to it we're working across all of DOD um, and DISA has been leading that. Um, the, department, the, the, the Department of Defense writ large is very focused on it. And I think in the maritime environment, it's particularly important that we get this one right. Um, we have had an, an ability to share information at the unclassified level you know, in the APAN construct. That's goodness, and I think everybody can migrate to it. But continuing to work those coalition comms, um, I've got two different groups that work that. But the M2I2 team, who uh, was in Tokyo last week, working on constant discussions and deliberations on how to how to improve that ability to share information. Okay, uh, are you waiting for a question in the back here? Or, no, I guess not. One more here for the active duty, and then over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, admirals, general. Uh, with the uh, Lieutenant Commander John Tai, USS Boxer, uh, with the evolving requirements for cybersecurity, the dwindling capacity as we have aging ships and platforms, Admiral Brown mentioned going from uh, 500 ships, now we're down to less than 300. Uh, where do you see the turning point in starting to build that capacity, build the capability back up while at the same time ensuring that we have nothing but the best going forward? Can you repeat the end of that question while at the same time ensuring? that we have nothing but the best going forward, ma'am. Take the capacity question on. Joe, you want to take it on? You know, I, I, I guess if anybody had the absolute, you know, date that you're looking for, <laughs> you know, we'd make that person the CNO, Secretary of the Navy, uh, you know, Secretary of Defense. Um, our job is, you know, fundamentally, in order to have the, the, the capabilities that we need today, but but still, uh, you know, to fight the missions and the, and, and the war fight of today, but at the same time, make sure that capability can endure and adapt to the threat and be what, be what you need there for tomorrow, for current readiness, future readiness. You've got to submit whole budgets. That's the bottom line. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's that simple, but it's not very easy. Uh, um, the, you know, the challenges of, uh, of, of budget caps uh, and if, you know, funding instabilities, the bullet talked about those, you know, those are absolutely killing us. Uh, the Secretary of Defense has testified to Congress that no enemy in the field has done more to, to damage the warfighting readiness of the United States military than sequestration. And when it comes to CRs, I mean, we're, 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 we're sitting here today, two days away from it all happening again. You know, uh, uh, we've had, you know, uh, the last nine years have, have all had CRs of some kind. I believe the last 12, the last 18 months have had a CR of some kind. Secretary of the Navy testified last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, that he, you know, he estimates that CRs have cost us $4 billion, not lost opportunity. He, he, went, he made a real point about how it's throw the money in the garbage can, put lighter fluid on it, and light it on fire. I don't, I don't know how you, anybody could say it any better than, than SECNAV did. 
Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the, for the submarine force, you're going to see a big turn point, because you're kind of looking for a date, you're going to see a big turn point in the early 20s when we break through the shipyard workload workforce mismatch that I talked about earlier. Uh, a bunch of things that created that perfect storm, that bow waved all that stuff into that period, are going to start to kind of break, break through, you know, break, break open. The refueling overhauls for the Ohio class submarine, which was never originally planned, it was a 30-year sub. We again, business decision, extend it to 42 years. Those are all going to finish up in about the 2020 time frame, 2021 time frame. All the SSN availabilities, of which USS Boise is the poster child for how not to do it. Uh, you know, years ago, we, uh, we extended that operating cycle from 48 months to, to uh, or 40, 44 months, 48 months to 72 months. That was a great idea at the time, but it bow waved right into where we are today. We, 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 we turned four Ohio class from BNs into GNs. That was never part of the plan. Great, great, great platform. Everybody wants them. But all that stuff created this perfect storm. So in the early 20s, that, that log jam is going to really break. And then when we finally get the two per year, and I would say minimum of minimum build rate of two per year for Virginia class, you'll see another kind of takeoff uh, in, uh, in, in the 2028 time frame. Uh, but so in the, in the meantime, we've got we've to we've have a powerful conversation about the Navy of the nation needs and, the, uh, uh, and, 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 the, and God bless Secretary Mattis is doing all the stuff he can with you know, you know, national strategy, defense strategy, you know, uh, nuclear posture review, the strategy is lining up to, to make the case. And then uh, we've, got to, we've got to submit whole budgets that, that allow us to have the capability for today and, and, the, and, and as well as the, the, what we need in the future, given, given the changing threat environment. Okay. Yes, sir. Thanks, over sir. here, as promised. Uh, Scott Kinner with the uh, Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. So a uh, quick question. Well, it's not a quick question, but uh, for the group. Uh, the last time the Navy Marine Corps team, you know, the Naval Services, the Nuclear Coast Guard Partners, everybody else actually fought a near-peer competitor was last century. Um, knowing that the force we have, we are buying today in the next couple of years is probably the force we're going to have in 10 years. Given all of that, um, from your perspectives as you sit in your, uh, your billets today, do you believe the Navy Marine Corps team is actually getting after how to fight the near-peer competitors and pulling that thread backward to the force you need to have in the next years? Or are we just on a linear path to do what we have today, just with some bells and whistles in 10, 15 years? Or are we looking at the problem set and then developing an actual force that can go out and execute as a team? Thank you. Okay. Admiral Brown, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I think absolutely we're, we're getting after that from the Navy and Marine Corps uh, team. Uh, if you just look at the integration of the F-35 into our amphibious readiness groups, that is changing the construct of, of, that, uh, of that force. Uh, we have uh, focused on uh, transitioning from the Marine Corps, and, and, and General Smith, jump in here at any time, principally serving uh, four deployed ashore back to our ships. Uh, there's been new energy and a reinvigoration of the Navy and Marine Corps team. Um, if you look at the, uh, our LSDs, the incredibly capable LPD platform, the interdiction of, the, like I said, of the F-35 onto our big deck amph amphibs, and the coordination that we're doing in fleet exercises with the Marine Corps, uh, we'll be ready for that fight. Yeah, I'll, uh, a quick answer is yes. I mean, we are absolutely, you know, pulling that back. All the time that I just spent, and you know, look, this audience, this, these comments have multiple audience, right? There's junior officers, there's trade, and there's also adversaries, because everything that we put out is being consumed by our adversaries. So the answer is, the last 15, 16 years we've been focusing on, uh, on the counterinsurgency fight, well now I'm focused on something else. And that's not false bravado. That should make you nervous. Because we got Marines who are just now re-experiencing as uh, my capstone classmate Adam Brown just said, getting back and doing naval integration. We just did it off San Clemente Island with line charges from the sea in the surf zone. And they're like, hey, sir, there's, there's great guys out there. There's these things called sailors on these amphibs, and we're actually working with them. They're awesome. They'll let you move LCUs and LCACs around. When we start putting our time back to that, and if you're an adversary, yeah, you should be really nervous about that. 
because we will become very good at what we do, at what we focus on. And what we're focused on right now is peer and near-peer competitors. Okay, got time for two more questions. Right here, sir, and then our Marine over here. Good morning. Good morning, Admiral. Good morning, General. My name is Commander Cetrin. I'm from the Brazilian Navy. My question is related with an issue that the Brazilian Navy has faced in the last two years. We are very concerned about the monitoring the level of stress of our crews to avoid accidents at sea. And I would like to know how the U.S. Navy is facing this problem. And if yes, uh, do you have any formal documents to reduce the probability of the accidents at sea due to the overwork of the sailors? So I'll take that one on. Um, you know, uh, if you look at uh, of what we did in the uh, early 2000s, um, you know, the, at, the, uh, at the end of the 80s, the, uh, the wall came down. And, and quite honestly, um, the United States, in, in cooperation with our allies and partners, we had sea control. By the mere fact that we all woke up uh, in the morning, we had control of the sea. Uh, and then 9-11 uh, happened and, and we really uh, ended up in a, a land war as we fought the scourge of terrorism um, uh, overseas. That's not the case anymore. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is, is we have emerging peer competitors and the, by virtue of the fact that us and our allies wake up in the morning, we don't um, necessarily have sea control. Um, in the, as a result of that, in the early 2000s, we, we had a number of things that happened. We had a revolution in training where we uh, went to kind of computer-based training. Uh, we started to optimally man our ships. Uh, we had a top six roll down on, 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 the, on the rank of sailors uh, that would fill certain billets. Uh, we went into a rapid acquisition uh, policy where we brought new technology to the ships, but we didn't necessarily buy the training that went with that new, new, new technology. Um, all those things taken uh, in solo were good things for the Navy, but then when you start to look at uh, how they all interacted, um, it wasn't necessarily the right, the right thing to do. Um, in uh, 2010, there was a report that came out that call, was called the Blau Report that really took a holistic view of all those actions and what does that mean to the surface force. In 2012, we really started rebuilding uh, our manning and our training uh, in the surface force. Uh, we, we, we spent over, over $178 million over three POM cycles rebuilding surface engineering training, and we had nearly the same amount of investment in surface combat systems training. Um, in October 2012, we, we started the basic division officer course. In July of 2012, we started the navigator course. Uh, we brought back gunnery officer course, the communication officer course, um, in October of 14, we built the Advanced Division Officer course. Uh, we arguably have one of the most rigorous command qualification processes uh, in the Navy uh, with a, a command assessment that really puts officers through the ringers of, um, of all the various facets from navigation, seamanship, and ship handling to uh, maritime warfare. Then we had the, the, the tragic events of 2017. So the, 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 the thing that I want to impress is there is not a single basic division officer course or advanced division officer course graduate who has started department head school. There is not a single officer who went through that very rigorous command assessment who's in the command pipeline right now. But those events of the 2017 uh, really made us take a step back and make sure that we have it right. Uh, we have a readiness uh, and review oversight uh, council uh, that is taking all the, the uh, recommendations from the comprehensive review that was conducted by Admiral Davidson and the, and the secretary's uh, readiness review and looking at it in a holistic view to make sure that we have the training right. Um, and, you know, I will say that uh, for the most part, the surface force, as I said earlier, is, a, is one of the pre preeminent naval surface forces in the world. But we can absolutely get better and make sure that our officers and our enlisted have the right training at the right time in their careers uh, to do that. Uh, so you will see uh, changes to the way that, uh, 
uh, and modifications to the way that we are training our junior officers and our mid-grade officers and our senior officers. And there will be assessment points uh, that happen uh, throughout an officer's career. But I, I've got to tell you, uh, I think that we're on the right path. And, um, and, uh, and it goes back to what General uh, Smith uh, said. We, we need to build time uh, into, uh, into the ship schedule for the commanding officer to make sure that his sailors are, are trained and ready to, ready to go. You know, one of, the, one of the fallouts of the things that we did in the, in the 2000s, and then as Admiral Tafalo talked about, is the sequestration and the Budget Control Act, is we have become incredibly efficient with the resources that we've had. But there's a downside to that, is as we've become incredibly efficient, we've lost a lot of flexibility. And I kind of equate this uh, to, you know, we're, we're we're coming into approach and we have a half a gallon of gas left in the tank and you better hope that nothing goes wrong so that you can land that aircraft and you can make that analogy across uh, all the services. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sudden death overtime, one minute. Okay, sir, I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, ma'am and gentlemen. I'm Major Goldman from VMX-1 in Yuma, Arizona. My question is about command and control in the future. So with um, new technologies today and emerging technologies in the future. I anticipate that the joint force um, will, the functions of command and control will not change, but how we execute them will change in the future. And my question to you is, how do we balance uh, leveraging the new technologies and taking advantage of those against the need to still operate in a degraded environment? Takers? Uh, here's how I'd answer that question. So if we go in a degraded comms environment, both sides are going to be in a degraded comms environment. And I think that the, um, the United States Navy uh, will have the upper hand because of what I led off this uh, panel with, and that's our concept of command. Uh, we, we have a concept of command that is second to none, and our commanding officers understand the mission, they understand their mission orders, and if we go into that calm, degraded environment, I don't think that you want to go up against one of our commanding officers. I would just add, uh, when you talk about the technology side, I think, uh, you know, what, what, we what we are striving for is to be able to take advantage of that technology, human machine teaming, artificial intelligence, to allow commanders potentially at every level to make better decisions, to synthesize information that's available. So whether you're talking about the tactical, strategic, or, or operational in the middle, um, you know, we want to we want to be able to leverage that technology to make speed of decision faster, to make the force more lethal. And if you know, in some cases, the way technology is going, you can carry an awful lot of information with you. You can integrate information from your own sensors, you know, right there. And, and having the ability to go mission command you know, at every level, um, we want to put, take advantage of that technology to, to aid in the decision making of those commanders, not necessarily you know, prevent or you know, rely d directly on the degraded environment or the lack of comms there. Okay, how about a, a nice round of applause for our great panel today. I'd like to thank the audience for great questions and um, just one plug for the February issue of Proceedings on that last question. We have uh, Admiral Scott Swift wrote an article that's in the February issue called Master the Art of Command and Control. He talks a, a lot about those issues that you just raised and he's also the luncheon speaker tomorrow uh, and probably would take that question on uh, as well. Uh, Admiral Crowder, General Smith, Admiral Ty, Admiral Tafalo, Admiral Miller, Admiral Brown, uh, thank you for joining us today, for being a panel, for uh, sharing your, your insights, your expertise, uh, and taking the hard questions. Uh, as a token of our thanks, we have a uh, AFSIA uh, bookmark, and we have a Naval Institute book called Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy by Toshi Yashihara and James Holmes. Uh, so thank you for your time and your uh, insights Can I just today. say one thing yes, with, with regard to Admiral Swift? As information warfare, I, I need to point out, he's today's lunch speaker. Oh, today's lunch speaker. I don't want to thank confuse you, the thank crowd, you. so I'm, that. I'm information, not misinformation. <laughs> I stand corrected. Thanks.
I'm showing up tomorrow. I'm expecting Emma Swift and finding me. Do you have 